All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Mike. I'm a web developer from Australia, so thank you very much for having me all the way over here on the other side of the world. Um, the Concat team has treated me fantastically, uh, much better than I deserve to be treated, uh, so I'm very appreciative of that. I've got a lot of stuff that I want to cover, so I'm going to jump uh, straight into this, the strategy guide uh, for CSS custom properties. What's happened to my slides? This is an awesome start. So when I minimize, it's there, but when I maximize, it's not. <laughs> I can't see. Okay. It's gone black again. It's my notes, everyone. Good luck. <laughs> Okay, so that was an awesome start. <laughs> so yes, my uh, talk is the uh, strategy guide to CSS custom properties. So as I said, I've got a lot to cover and I've got even less time now. So <laughs> custom properties are now supported in all modern browsers and this means that I'm starting to see examples of people using them in production. And of course this is a great thing, but they're also different uh, from variables in preprocessors, which you're probably all familiar with. Uh, and I've already seen a lot of examples of people using them uh, in similar ways without necessarily considering what advantages they have to offer. And I think that custom properties have the potential to change how we write and structure CSS uh, to quite a significant uh, extent, and to some extent too, how we use JavaScript to interact with UI components. So this is essentially what my talk is going to be about. I'm not going to focus so much on the syntax and things like that. Um, I think it's the strategy that separates uh, the best players of any game uh, rather than knowing the rules, and I know that you're all uh, top players of the web, so I'm going to focus more on strategy for you. Okay, so very quickly, just for new players, we'll cover the basics. So they're a little bit like variables in preprocessors, uh, and you'll be f the, one of the most obvious differences you'll notice at first is syntax. So in SAS, we might use a dollar sign like this to denote a variable. Uh, in less, we use an at symbol. And we have a similar syntax uh, with custom properties. We use a dash dash symbol to denote uh, a custom property. But you'll see an, an obvious difference there. Uh, we have a different method for assigning a value to a custom property than we do for retrieving that value. So when we're retrieving a value, we just use that little var function there. And that'll be familiar if you've used anything like calc or a trib or min max or any of these more functional parts of CSS uh, that are creeping uh, into the modern language. So hopefully that's not too difficult a distinction to remember. Now, another ma um, major difference is that variables in preprocessors can be used almost anywhere. So this means that they can be used inside uh, or outside declaration blocks, inside media rules. They can even be used to form a part of a selector like that. And all of those examples would be invalid uh, with custom properties. So custom properties, on the other hand, they can be used anywhere that a normal CSS property can be used. And basically that means inside a declaration block or between some of those squiggly braces that you might have seen. That's what they mean. Um, so there's also a difference between uh, how, we can, how we use the uh, var function and uh, regular preprocessor variables. So we can use the var function anywhere we'd normally use a value in CSS. And so that means that they can be used as a single value. Uh, they can be used as part of a shorthand statement next to other custom properties, keywords, or other values. Uh, or they can be used even as part of uh, a calc function there. Unfortunately, we can't use them uh, as part of media rules or as part of a uh, 
pseudo-selectors, so we can't use them in things like nth child either. And that's probably all that I uh, need you to know about custom properties for today. Uh, there's probably a lot more things that you want to know about the syntax, like uh, how do you do fallback values? Can you assign custom properties to other custom properties? Uh, the answer to that is yes, but I'm going to skip over most of that, and this should be enough to uh, get you onto the concepts that I need you to uh, be aware of for strategies. OK, so cosmetic differences aside, the most significant difference between variables in preprocessors and custom properties is how they're scoped. We can refer to variables as either statically or dynamically scoped, and preprocessor variables are statically scoped. So what this means is that we can change or update the value at different points in the compilation process, but when this is rendered to CSS, all of those variables are gone. Those things are static, uh, so therefore they have to be static values. Custom properties work a little bit differently. Uh, they're dynamically scoped, and where CSS is concerned, this means that uh, custom properties are subject to inheritance and the cascade. So in other words, the property is tied to a selector, and if the value of that custom property changes, it changes for all matching elements within the page, all matching DOM elements, just like any other property would that's attached to a selector. And this is great because it means we can change the value of a custom property using a media query or a hover state or something like that. And we can have different values for the same custom property uh, in different areas on the same page. So in addition to being static or dynamic, Variables, variables can also be either global or local. Uh, and if you write JavaScript, this is something that you're going to be familiar with. Uh, variables can either be applied to everything uh, within an application, or their scope can be limited to specific functions or blocks of code. And custom properties are similar. So custom properties are by default locally scoped to the selectors that we apply them to. So they're kind of local variables. But custom properties are also inherited. So this means that in many situations, they behave kind of like global variables as well, uh, especially when they're applied to the root selector. So this isn't anything new. Uh, when it comes to CSS, we have some things that are global. And these, this is some examples from the Lonely Planet style guide. And they have um, global colors, uh, topography, spacing, things like this. These are things that you want applied globally and consistently across your application. And we also have local things too. And many style guides also have uh, these UI components, and they have various variables and variations that we want applied specifically to these components. So for example, buttons. Uh, and in this case, we have a number of color variations here. We wouldn't want these applied to every input element within a website or an application, uh, and we wouldn't, definitely wouldn't want them applied to everything uh, within a site. That wouldn't make sense. So as it turns out, most global things in CSS also tend to be static. Your brand colors, your topography, your spacing, these things, they don't tend to change significantly uh, from one component to another. And they don't really even change from one build of your application to another. Now, of course, they, they can change. But where they do, it tends to be um, a global rebrand or something like that. And it's something that um, happens rarely on a mature product. And this is why I think it makes sense to continue using preprocessors uh, for static variables. And, as, and besides from helping keep those static and dynamics concerns sort of separate, uh, it visually denotes static variables in your code. And this can make CSS a whole lot easier to read. You instantly know which things are global across your application and perhaps shouldn't be changed uh, in a local context. And similarly, you'll uh, have a much better idea of which things are local and dynamic. So if you're taking notes, this is one to write down. This is one of the most important strategies for working with custom properties. And I think if you do this alone, uh, it'll make your life a whole lot easier. So by reflection, you might think that if all global things should be static, then perhaps all local things should be dynamic. And this is, tends to be the case, but uh, local things are likely to be dynamic, but that rule is nowhere near as strong as the tendency for global things to be static. And when I say static, I mean preprocessor. When I say dynamic, I mean custom properties. So just keep that in mind. But I think it's perfectly OK uh, in many situations to have locally static uh, preprocessor variables. And this makes sense, especially for more complex UI components. But of course, complex UI components don't make fantastic slides. So this is the simplest example that I could come up with uh, for something like this. And I've used the button example again. So what I've done here is I've prefixed these custom properties with the component name. And that way, I know that they're uh, 
for just this component only. Um, and what I'm doing here is I'm using these variables mainly as a developer convenience. I can put them at the top of a component.css file. I can update them in one place. And of course, this makes more sense if I'm using the variable multiple times or if I'm deriving other values from this. So say I was deriving padding or margin from the size variable as well uh, by multiplying or dividing it or something like that. Uh, that makes a lot of sense, and I think we should continue to do that. But I want you to imagine uh, a situation now where we want the small variation of the button to always be used on mobile devices, and then to change the size of the button only above, say, 800 pixels or something like that uh, for larger devices. And now suddenly we have a more dynamic situation here. We have uh, something that I'd be more likely to use custom properties for because it's tied to a condition within the DOM. And that's what custom properties are really good for. So it helps to know that you can assign um, preprocessor variables to custom properties. And that's exactly what I'm doing in this exa example here. Uh, I'm creating a button size custom property. And I'm giving it an initial size of button small. And that's applied to every button element. Then using a media query, I can change the value of the custom property uh, to either the large or the medium variation. And then finally, at the end, I write out the value of that custom property uh, in one place. So this results in static variables becoming locally dynamic. And this is a really handy uh, technique if you want to sort of, or especially if you're working with an existing code base where you have some of these things and you want to start converting stuff over to custom properties. Uh, this might be a technique that makes a lot of sense for you. OK, so just a very quick diversion that I don't have time for. Uh, hands up anyone who's ever built an overly complex abstraction with SAS only to tie themselves in a knot and go back to using preprocessors for just variables. That pretty much describes my experience with SAS. Uh, and it's probably something that's familiar to uh, a lot of you. It's something that we tend to do. Uh, especially with new technologies, and I think it's something that we'll continue to do uh, with custom properties as well. Now, on this topic, I read a really cool blog post on the Free Code Camp Medium. Uh, it was by Bill Sawyer, and it was called uh, Don't Do It at Runtime, Do It at Design Time. And he gave this example. I don't know if anyone can read what this is doing, but basically it's lo looping over character codes and creating an array that contains the letters of the alphabet. And it's really clever. It's concise. Uh, it's obviously faster than writing this all out by hand. Uh, but I agree with the author, this is not necessarily good production code, because I want to actually see what's in that array, and we read code many more times than we write it. Um, I would much rather see all of those values written out into an array. Uh, and this all, um, this all works at runtime, right? So like preprocessor variables, they, they're a preprocessing step, obviously, whereas custom properties, they work in runtime. Uh, so things that made sort of borderline sense in terms of complexity with preprocessors might not be a good idea for custom properties. And here's an example that someone sent me recently. This, this is a modular scale using custom properties and calc. And what this is doing is it's calculating. So uh, a modular scale is like it takes a ratio, uh, which we have at the top there, uh, and we multiply that ratio by the custom property that came before it to step up and get a number of different sizes. And these work well for like spacing and topography and things like that. I love modular scales, and I could talk about them more, um, but unfortunately, I don't have time for that. So what, all I need you to know is that we're calculating this on the fly in the browser. And what this means is that we can update the value of the font scale custom property using a media query or using any other selector. And then all of those uh, modular scale values are going to be recalculated on the fly in the browser. And when I first saw this, I was like, wow, this is a really good idea. Uh, but then I tried it, and I realized I'd much rather have something like this. Because once again, once I set these values, I'm not likely to change them very often. So if you want to do something like the previous example uh, for prototyping, that might be a good idea. Um, but once you have these values, it's a much better idea to copy them into the code. Now, this, of course, can still be improved. It violates the rule that I said before. All global values should be static. And I'd much rather use preprocessor variables for something like this and convert them to locally uh, dynamic custom properties as required using that technique I showed you. Um, and as well as that, I don't want to end up in a situation where I'm switching from using one of these custom properties, say font size 1 to font size 2. Uh, that's not really a good idea with custom properties. And that brings me to my next strategy. And this is, again, a really important strategy. If you're, if you're taking notes, please underline this one. And that is change the value not the variables. Um, and unfortunately, I see a lot of examples like this with custom properties. 
And this is exactly how we would have done something with preprocessors. We start off with uh, two variables in the beginning, then you, we, we assign the initial variable, then we change it using a media query or something else, and we swap to using uh, the other variable. It makes sense with preprocessors, but it doesn't make a great deal of sense uh, with custom properties. So a far better way to do this with custom properties is to define a single font size variable for the component. And then using a media query, we can update the value of the custom property. And then finally, at the end, we can write out the example uh, in one place like this. And you'll notice that this example, the media query only updates the value of the custom property. And there's only one place that I've written out the value uh, of that. And that was the same with some previous examples that I showed you. And there are reasons for this. And that brings me to my next set of strategies, which is strategies for responsive design. Now, one of the difficulties with responsive design when it relies heavily uh, on media queries, which it often does, is that a lot of the uh, values can become fragmented across the page. We've tried different things, like co-locating all, all the media queries together so that we have all the um, selectors inside one big media query. Uh, we've tried sort of separating them out and using hundreds of media queries. Nothing's really worked. This has always been a problem with CSS. We've never really known uh, when a CSS property is going to be changed. So custom properties can help, help us to organize some of this logic related to responsive design in a way that we haven't been able to do up until now, and I think that that's something that's incredibly powerful. So if it changes, it's a variable. This is, this is a really important strategy. Again, you'll notice I've got a lot of important strategies in this talk. So this means that if you're using a media query to update anything other than a custom property, uh, perhaps you're not taking full advantage of custom properties. Um, so this means that we can move any of the values that change along with the media queries that change them into a custom property and up to the top of a document. And if we do things that, like this, it means that media queries should never be used for anything other than changing custom properties. And what this results in is a clear separation of logic from design. And that's one of the, uh, the key points of using uh, custom properties, or one of the, the biggest advantages of using custom properties uh, for me. This means that all of our logic should now be at the top of the document. And whenever we see a var statement in our CSS, we immediately know that that is a value that's going to change. And with Previous methods of writing CSS, we've had no way um, of knowing which values are going to change just by reading it at a glance. You had to interpret and understand the entire style sheet, or at least the entire component, to get an idea of what's changing. And this link between logic and design becomes incredibly useful. So I think it makes sense for all of the logic and all of the custom properties and all of the preprocessor variables to be at the top of a document. This is not a new idea. It's something that we do. Uh, in many different programming languages, and now we have the means to do this in CSS as well. And I call this uh, idea the logic fold. It's just a metaphor that makes sense for me, because CSS is kind of a design language, and whatever, there isn't a fold. Um, anyway, but what this means is that all the variable declarations and all of the, the selectors and media queries that change um, those custom properties will be at the top of the document, and below, the doc uh, below that fold will be highly declarative CSS, that's simple uh, and easy to read and understand. And it actually reminds me of how CSS used to be many years ago before we had uh, media queries and some of the necessary complexities of, of modern CSS. And it's actually quite nice to write things in this way. So I just wanted to show you a quick example here. So this is uh, generating a six-column flexbox grid system. And this is an example of the code that would be above the fold. So you can see there that we're setting an initial display mode of block. And then using a media query, we're changing the row display mode to flex. And what that means is that all of these column basis custom properties as well are going to suddenly come into play. So that's the above the fold code. And then below the fold, uh, you can see that I have a var statement there with row display. So I know that that's a property that's going to change. If I want to check how that's changing, I just go back to my previous slide and I can uh, trace the logic there. And then similarly, uh, I can see that uh, I only have one. I don't need a different uh, declaration for all of these um, selectors here, because the value of the flex basis custom property is going to be changing depending on uh, which class here has been applied. So I'm changing only the custom property. Uh, and all of those uh, can have the same 
declarative code there, so it's, it's a lot neater and easier uh, to read. Okay, as well as that, it's actually really easy to remove stuff, and this is another really um, key advantage of this. So imagine if we had another media query here in this example for a tablet display. Uh, I can just remove it, and then I can retrace the logic and see how things were going to change. There's far less risk of me ending up inheriting a value that I didn't expect uh, because I wanted to delete something. And being able to delete code uh, is an excellent strategy when, no matter what uh, language you're writing. But of course, all rules are meant to be broken, and that brings me to my next set of strategies for theming. Now, throughout this talk, I've argued a lot that um, I've argued against uh, using CSS custom properties for like these global dynamic variables. But you'll also notice in a lot of those examples, I was kind of like hedging my statement with um, things like 90% of cases and almost always and things like that. And theming is the main reason for that. So theming generally refers to being able to update uh, parts of the UI for individual users or things like that. So here's an example from Twitter. I can update my theme colors. Uh, I can change my photo and things like that. Um, and these can be global things like this, or they can be more local things as well. Uh, so for example, I use a Google Keep application to take notes, and I can select the, uh, a different color for each of the notes in the UI. So they can be either global theme changes or local things. Um, and the great thing about custom properties is there's no need to write out a separate style sheet for these things to override existing values. We can just update uh, the value of the custom properties. So when we're doing this, it's a special kind of custom property. It's something that's global, uh, it's dynamic, uh, it's a little bit dangerous, in fact, and you should be really careful about using examples like this, so use a lot of discretion with this. Um, but luckily, Custom properties are case sensitive. So what I normally do with these examples is I capitalize uh, the custom property so that you know that this particular dynamic variable is something that may be changed somewhere else inside the CSS. And if you're still splitting up your CSS into different files, which you probably will be, uh, that becomes really useful as well. Um, so when I'm doing this now, I can update the value of those global variables or those global custom properties using JavaScript, uh, using media queries, using um, a number of different methods. So if you want to update custom properties with JavaScript, uh, there's a fairly simple API for doing this, and it looks something like this. So what I'm doing here is I'm setting the value of the theme color custom property on the root element or on the document element. And um, one of the cool things about this is I don't have to sort of uh, hard code into my JavaScript how this affects uh, the document. I can just write. So normally, I, I'd not recommend using custom properties on the root element. Uh, because you want to sort of scope them to local components. But for the case of theming, it's not a bad idea. Uh, I can write all of those out to the root element, and then if you have a technical design team who writes CSS, they can decide how that particular variable is going to be used and change that in different places in the style sheet uh, without updating uh, any other JavaScript or without having to sort of uh, work across the team. Okay, so. Uh, you can also use style attributes to write this stuff out. So if you're rendering on the server, uh, if you're using a templating language or something like this, uh, using this little example here, this is how you might do it for, say, like a note attribute, uh, a note uh, component like I was talking about before. You can just set the value of the theme color on that component, and it will only affect that instance of the component. So you, uh, that's effectively what the example from uh, JavaScript before did as well. So you can still do that with JavaScript, and I'm a big fan of this pattern. Uh, it also allows us to do a number of different CSS tricks with custom properties, which unfortunately I'm not going to have time to get into. Um, the final strategy I have for you is to start using custom properties today. Right? Um, many of you have perhaps avoided using custom properties because uh, older versions of IE and things like that don't necessarily support them. Uh, but so much of what I've been talking about today has to do with how we organize uh, and structure the CSS. So we can still use things like post-CSS uh, to convert a lot of those examples to uh, older CSS, if you like. So this is the one you want here. It's post-CSS CSS variables, not these ones here. Um, it's super confusing, but um, 
basically, if you get that one there, what it does is it writes out all of the uh, declarations that you made inside media queries and things like that into a longer form of CSS. The only things that you won't be able to convert, obviously, is the use of uh, global theming techniques and where you've used JavaScript to update um, values, but all of the responsive design techniques and the earlier things I talked about, uh, you, can, you can write that in an, in an older method of, of writing CSS, it's just more difficult to maintain. So you can start doing this today. Uh, what I do is I generate two style sheets, one for modern browsers, one for older browsers. Um, I'm not going to have time to go into the workflow, but uh, I hope to publish a blog post on that, which I'll, which I'll share with the Concat team. Um, and yeah, I, I serve the older one to older browsers using sort of a critical CSS method, uh, and the newer browsers simply get all the features of custom properties. So the final question you probably have is, does it work? And I can say it definitely works for me. I've been writing CSS like this uh, for a long time, not just on my personal sites, but wherever possible for work projects as well. And in fact, it's been really, really difficult for me to go back to other methods of writing CSS. Uh, if I'm updating a, a normal CSS property using a media query now, um, it absolutely terrifies me because I have no idea how I'm going to maintain it. So um, I think it's a huge advantage. And that is all I have time for. I understand that was a whirlwind of information. Uh, if you have any more questions, please come and see me. Uh, I've got plenty more examples I want to share with people as well. Thank you so much for your time. I'm sorry I went over.